I'm Andy Andrews, a New York Times best-selling author and longtime resident of Orange Beach, Alabama. Because I write for a living, and you don't have to write in any particular place, people often ask me why I choose to live here. There are many reasons, but let me tell you a little bit about the place I choose to live. A town isn't born overnight. It grows in increments over time. It develops a character of its own with each passing year. Every adversity, every triumph, every resident helps form the heart of a place that its people call home. The story of Orange Beach, Alabama is one of dogged pioneers who carved a home from a wild land. It's the tale of a tiny fishing village that became a thriving city. It's a saga of nature, but mostly it's a story of the people who made this seaside hamlet their home. I came to Orange Beach full time in about 1975 and moved on to property that had been settled by my grandfather back in 1875. I was born down here in 1940, right across the street from where we are right now. We moved here on July 14, 1949. Bought a little place down in Orange Beach at, uh, in uh, 1954. Paid $450 for the lot. I'm a late comer. I can't, didn't come here until the 50s. I'd say uh, 65, 66. My parents decided we'd move down permanently. My parents had a place down at Bear Point since I, I think it was the late 60s. Blessed by geography, Orange Beach is surrounded by water. From the Gulf of Mexico that laps against its white sand beaches to the back bays and coves, water has played a large part in this town. Orange Beach sits at the eastern end of what is now known as Pleasure Island, with its neighbor, Gulf Shores, occupying the west end of the island. Situated directly on the Gulf of Mexico and midway between Mobile Bay to the west and Pensacola Bay to the east, this area welcomed Native Americans, European explorers, and even a few pirates long before the first modern settlers and tourists arrived. Native Americans occupied this area in the years before European expansion. Early tribes such as the Creeks, the Alabamas, and the Seminoles lived on the rich bounty of the land and sea. Indian mounds made of oyster shells and artifacts from early times could once be found scattered throughout the area. The most famous of these, the Bear Point Mound, reportedly held the skeleton of an eight-foot Native American. Most mounds have been displaced by development, and those that remain are located on private property, but it's still not uncommon to find shards of pottery and other remnants of this previous culture along our shores. Archaeologists have also uncovered pottery pieces on area islands that date back to prehistoric times. When Europeans began exploring the region, Orange Beach provided a hospitable stopover between Pensacola and Mobile Bays. Spanish, the Portuguese, the French, and English explorers all visited the area. So did those pirates who prowled the Gulf of Mexico. These seagoing bandits used the area's sheltered bays as hideouts, where they found provisions like fresh water and they would clean their boats' hulls. Local islands served as lookout posts, allowing pirates to spy the unlucky ships traveling just offshore in the Gulf. The first modern settlers staked their claims in the early 1800s. Attracted by the vast waterways and abundant pine forest, these hard scrabble homesteaders lived on the land and the water. By the 1860s, Three distinct communities emerged. Bear Point at the eastern end of the peninsula, Orange Beach at the western edge of town, and Caswell in the center, so named for one of the earliest families. The Walkers and Calloways, two families who would prove influential in the town's growth, also established themselves around this time. My name's Earl Calloway. My family homestead in Orange Beach in 1873. We were part of the original Callaways that came from the lagoon, which came from Dolphin Island, which came from Cornwall, England. Orange Beach was named for the citrus orchards that once covered this land. 
Lemuel Walker Sr., a patriarch of those early days, planted the first orchards in cleared pine forests. A hard freeze in the 1920s decimated the citrus trees, but today you can still see a scattering of those original orange jeweled trees that remained. And of course, for some years now, residents have been bringing back the old days by planting citrus trees of their own. Thanks to the region's vast pine forest, a turpentine industry arose in the mid-1800s. You can still find pine trees in the woods around Wolf Bay with the signature cat face scars that indicate the turpentine harvesters were there. Other industries including shingle making and ship stores. Large schooners transported these local wares to Pensacola, New Orleans, and all the way to the Caribbean. In fact, boats of all sizes were a part of everyday life in Orange Beach and far more prevalent than automobiles. It's no surprise that Orange Beach would soon become famous as a fishing village. My great-grandfather was named James Calloway. They called him Captain Jim. He built two schooners right here on the shore behind us on Wolf Bay. They were pretty much 70 to 75 feet long, three-masted, gaff-rigged. And Pensacola was a big lumber town at that time. We would sail those ships to Pensacola and load them up with wood, with naval spirits and turpentine and kerosene. Then they had absolutely no instruments other than a compass. And they would head out from Pensacola and the first stop would always be Key West. And they would drop a little off at Key West or give them some fresh water or whatever. In 1905, John Foley, a northern businessman and a keen land speculator, paved the way for development on the Alabama Gulf Coast. Foley built a rail line into southern Baldwin County and a train depot 10 miles north of the Gulf, essentially founding the town that now bears his name. Foley recruited heavily in his hometown Chicago, touting South Alabama's mild climate, rich soil, and of course, the pristine Gulf beaches. Investors came in droves. From the Foley train station, investors traveled bumpy dirt roads to the boondocks of Gulf Shores and Orange Beach. Many of the family names that remain in Orange Beach and throughout Baldwin County traced their roots to these early investment days. Orange Beach grew as families settled into the new town. Citizens united to build a post office, a school, and a few stores for regular groceries and supplies. But Orange Beach residents in the early 20th century still lived a Spartan life. Most families ate what they grew, hunted, or caught from the sea. Roads were rough and unreliable, and the cars very few. 59 was a red clay road. And in, red, in bad weather, you couldn't travel it. I mean, you would fly in the ditch. No electricity, outhouses, pitcher pumps. It was just a great place. We had row crops. We right across the street here. We had 10 acres of sugar cane. We made rum and molasses. My granddad, back before they had stock loans, his cows were on Ono Island. They were not over there, but cows and goats and whiskey still back in those days. And he, he had a barge that had cattle sides on it. And we'd go there once a year and bring one back and have it butchered, you know. And then this place was just alive with wild hogs. And we, you know, I was just a little fella. We'd go out and he'd trap them and bring them home and feed them up on corn. And then the first cool morning, he'd butcher about three of them in a big smokehouse. He was the only farmer on the island. Yeah, he pretty much kept it. In the winter he, months, he, he kept, farmed. It, kept them alive with something he called it in Orange Beach. Yet, life was good filled with rewarding work, a strong sense of camaraderie, and warm afternoons splashing in the bays, lagoons, and coves that made up Orange Beach at that time. Curiously, the residents paid very little attention to the beach itself. After all, you couldn't grow anything on it. We grew up more on the backwaters than we did the beach itself. The beach, uh, as, you know, as beautiful as it is, it was more for uh, the tourists than it was to me for the locals. The locals knew other areas that to, to us were a little more special. Soon, however, tourists would come to recognize the incredible offerings of Orange Beach. 
and the sleepy fishing village would grow beyond anyone's belief. Back in those days, everybody pretty much knew everybody. And of course, those of us, <clears throat> myself included, that were so nosy, we did know everybody, knew who they were. And I counted the people that lived in Orange Beach at the time, all the way to Alabama Point. And as my memory goes, there was 136 souls that lived here. That's from babies to granddaddies. We only had one bus that would pick up every child from, from first grade to, to 12th grade and take them to Foley. So everybody knew everybody, pretty much. And, but we all got along. And uh, anytime there was an issue or a problem, you helped each other. By the turn of the 20th century, Orange Beach had established itself as a vibrant town on the Alabama Gulf Coast, but big changes were ahead. With the construction of the Intercoastal Waterway, the U.S. Corps of Engineers dramatically altered the landscape of Orange Beach and Gulf Shores. This inland shipping canal runs along the Gulf and Atlantic coast. When the local section of the canal was completed in 1932, it made an island of Alabama's twin coastal towns. Travelers now had to cross a floating bridge in Gulf Shores. For boaters, however, the canal provided a new waterway to navigate and explore. I never had a car, but I had a boat. <laughs> I had a, a stouter built that had a 10 horsepower Johnson on it, and you know, I would, go in that boat from here to Bear Point to, to visit uh, my friend uh, Ronald Lowe. And then a lot of times we would take it and go on around to Pirate's Cove. And when I got ready to leave Margaret and Hubert's, I'd call my mother and I'd say, okay, I'm, I'm headed back home. Fishing has been a part of Orange Beach since before Europeans reached the continent. As the town grew, so did the fishing industry. Boat builders established thriving businesses and the most renowned builders were in high demand. Boats provided transportation, they carried cargo to and from town, and most of all, they provided the livelihood for many Orange Beach families. We went looking for boats all over the United States, never did find a boat that we wanted. Came back and hired Rose Mundo at Perdita Beach to build the boat. We got the lumber out of Clisby Swamp, had the lumber cut, it was all juniper and cypress. And Ray went every day by boat over there and helped that boat. They started building it in November and we fished it in April. And so Ray said, let's see if this boat can catch a link. So he and I got on that boat. It was cold weather, I remember I had a jacket. Went out there, saw this sling, caught it, and when Ray gaffed it, it came off the gaff when he threw it in the boat, and that, that ling nearly beat us to death. We finally took our coats and threw on the ling because it's still alive. <laughs> and it just traveled all over that cockpit of that boat. So then we came home. <laughs> the area's unique geography makes for ideal fishing. The Gulf of Mexico offers some of the world's best fisheries, including deep water sites a short boat ride away. Protected bays and coves provide calmer waters when the Gulf gets rough. Orange Beach was so quiet back then. If you got up in the morning and just walked out of the house, if you could hear the Gulf roar and you knew you weren't going fishing, it was too rough. That's how quiet it was around. In Orange Beach, fishing was a way of life. It also paved the way for the town's tourism industry. We would rent these cottages to fishermen, and then we'd get up 3 a.m., feed them breakfast, pack their lunch, and they were on the boat at 6.30. But you know, back then, charter fishing was like April, May, June, July, and August. After Labor Day, there was no fishing down here, except we could commercial fish. When we wanted money, we could get on that boat and go out there and catch all the snappers we wanted. And so, there's no limit. You had one week in, during the spring break that was real big. And then you had from, uh, basically from Memorial Weekend to Labor Day. And when I said it was over at Labor Day, it was over at Labor Day. You would, the people back then, you would have a business on the beach and you would board those windows up Labor Day day, about five o'clock, boards in the windows, that was it till, till that spring break week. 
and done. You wouldn't see anybody. It was a ghost town. You know, those days obviously are gone. Early tourists came from Baldwin County, Mobile, and even farther to fish the Gulf and the Back Bays, just like the locals. It wasn't long before locals recognized the opportunity for new businesses. A lot of people were coming, starting to come to Orange Beach. Um, let's face it, Orange Beach, the, the water draws you, the fishing draws you, and uh, people um, um, saw, the, saw the beauty of it. And they did not have hardly, you know, any, any accommodations if anybody wanted to stay, you know, overnight or to stay a week. The Orange Beach Hotel opened in 1923 on the north side of the island overlooking Wolf Bay. Though it changed hands several times, the hotel welcomed visitors for several decades. The building now belongs to the city of Orange Beach and houses the Coastal Arts Center. Other accommodations followed. Gulf View Park in the 1930s. Gulf Gate Lodge opened in the 50s and remained a local legend for 30 years. Whitecaps, Orange Beach's first Gulf Front Hotel, opened in 1960 with the area's first swimming pool. Many more came and went over the years. At the same time, Orange Beach's charter fishing industry was born. At first, locals would rent their boats to the out-of-towners, but no one knew the waters like the locals. And it was only a matter of time before visitors began paying local fishermen for guided fishing trips. Back then, fishing was different. You fished the same people. Like every other Sunday, we would fish the Wilson Insurance Company. We fished UJ Chevrolet one day a week. We fished the people who owned that nursery up there one day a week. They'd either take their customers or they went themselves. So you had the same repeat customers. Charter fishing proved wildly popular and has been a mainstay of the local economy ever since. The Orange Beach Fishing Association, established in the 1960s, was among the first of its kind. Dr. Holmes, which was the MD in Foley, of course had money, and he financed a boat for James Amel called the Red Wing, and that was the first charter boat. Today, Orange Beach boasts one of the largest charter fishing fleets on the entire Gulf Coast. Early fishing wasn't without its difficulties. Sometimes just getting into the Gulf presented a challenge. The passage between Wolf Bay and the Gulf of Mexico, now known as Perdido Pass, was originally farther east, near the Florida state line. A hurricane moved the pass to its current location, separating Alabama Point from Florida. And at low tide, getting through the shallow pass required skill and great timing. In the old days, you had no jetties. The pass would appear and disappear and change and from uh, hour to hour. So uh, you had to really know what you were doing. And the, and the old, old cat salt captains, they knew what they were doing. You know, the past was not like it right. is now. Mm -hmm. And they had this big schooner, and if they couldn't come in here, they had to come in to the coast. Mm -hmm. well, when this one blocked, one day, the Callaway men and their wives went over there with shovels mm -hmm. and opened, opened it up, up that some of the Gulf. Orange Beach flourished in the decades after World War II. Many early visitors fell in love with the area and built cottages of their own, returning summer after summer, before eventually moving permanently to town. Meanwhile, development along the beach proliferated as hotels and cottages were built to accommodate the growing numbers of summer visitors. For the newcomers, life in a fishing backwater presented new challenges. For the most part, however, it was a wonderful time in this idyllic beachside town. For those fortunate enough to grow up in Orange Beach during those years, it was a time of fishing and carefree fun. We always had a family reunion on the 4th of July, and uh, my uncle had a, a 40 Willys uh, Jeep, and he'd load all us kids up on it and go down to the beach and we'd climb the sand dunes. And for those that don't remember, sand dunes back there can be 20, 25 foot tall. It was but we'd ride up and down those sand dunes, all up and down the beach, because there were no condoms. We fished, we'd swim. Anything to do with the water, you know, and I, I taught lots of cousins and their friends how to water ski. I mean, you know, and, and we would be in, in, in the water out here almost by the time we finished breakfast until 
they were telling us to come in at night. Uh, whether it was fishing, whether it was crabbing, whether it was skiing, or anything to do with a boat, obviously you, you, that's what you did. We swam, we skied, we gigged everything that moved, we knitted everything that moved, we threw cast nets, you know, we uh, chased what few tourist girls there was, you know. In a century, Orange Beach had grown from a sleepy fishing village to a bustling summer destination. But an unwelcome visitor was about to once again change the face of Orange Beach. Hurricanes are an unavoidable part of life on the Gulf Coast. Despite our best preparations, these massive late summer storms can wreak havoc on coastal communities. Orange Beach endured its share of hurricanes in the early years. Big storms hit the Alabama coast in 1906, 1911, 1916, and again in 1926 before hurricanes were even named. In 1979, Hurricane Frederick directly hit Orange Beach, causing massive damage. But coastal communities are resilient. As they'd done so many times before, friends, families, and neighbors banded together to help one another rebuild their homes and businesses and their town. Frederick's biggest impact, however, was felt on the beach. The wooden cottages and hotels that lined the sand did not fare well against the ferocious storm and most were lost. What followed was a building boom of unprecedented scale on the Alabama Gulf Coast. Developers seized the opportunity to build larger complexes on the Gulf Front, fueled by the relatively new condo concept. These new, higher density buildings could accommodate more tourists. As the new buildings went up, so did Orange Beach's popularity as a vacation destination. You know, uh, Tommy Marr, came over here and built our first uh, sewer, system. sewer system. It was a private uh, enterprise, mm -hmm. and uh, that made it possible for us to have our first condominiums. And I believe they were known as the Breakers. Yeah, I think. And I believe that happened uh, about 1980 or 81, which was right after uh, Hurricane Frederick. With the new growth came a need for municipal organization. Throughout its history, Orange Beach operated as an unincorporated town within Baldwin County. Despite the growth on the beaches, the town provided no services of its own and lacked the ability to regulate or protect its citizens. In the early 80s, a group of business leaders and residents united to organize Orange Beach into a true city. In 1984, the newly incorporated city elected its first city council and mayor. First thing we provided was the police service. Well, police protection, because uh, that was something that was really needed here, is the police, is police protection. Because you had very little, you know, you could have a break in and, it, and uh, the county didn't have any facilities to come here and look at stuff like that. They might come a day or a day and a half later on a break in to see, to help you out. They just didn't have the, the, the manpower. There were a lot of absentee owners down here that were on the campsites and stuff like that. And then people would come down here and go down to the end of a long, long road where there wasn't anybody living like that and just break in, not take anything, but just come in and use the facilities. But the town was growing and uh, there was more people moving in and they needed more services in the area. And uh, these gentlemen felt that they, you know, they could that could take place, you know, if we get to town, the city going. In 2004, it was Hurricane Ivan that pounded the Alabama Gulf Coast. Orange Beach was hit hard. But once again, residents rallied and rebuilt their spirits undaunted. We still are proud of our heritage. Everyone here is proud of our fishing heritage, our charter fleet. Uh, they're proud to know the patriarchs and matriarchs of our town that are still here and to hold them in a uh, high esteem. So even though we've grown, I, I don't know that we've changed a whole lot as a, as a community and I think that's something we ought to all appreciate and, and be proud of. Today, Orange Beach is a vibrant vacation destination that attracts tens of thousands of visitors annually. Tall condominiums stand shoulder to shoulder along the beach. There's now a university, the South's largest Ferris wheel, and sometimes even traffic. 
But in many ways, Orange Beach hasn't changed all that much. For those of us who live here and those who have lived here all their lives, Orange Beach is still a small town. It's a place where you can bump into a friend while fishing on a pier or strolling on the beach. It's a community filled with pride and determination. It's a place where friends and family and neighbors look out for one another and lift each other up. And the fishing is still as good as it's ever been. Some time ago, Orange Beach leaders adopted the motto, Life is Better Here, to tout the city's attributes and hospitality. For those of us who live in and love Orange Beach, life is better here. In fact, it always has been.